This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 128, for broadcast on the 25th of October, 2023. Coming up on Space Time, the dramatic history of the Andromeda Galaxy, quartz crystals discovered in the clouds of a gas giant, and trying to understand the sun's heating processes. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has unveiled the violent history of our nearest neighbouring big galaxy, M31 in Andromeda. The study, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, is based on new computer modelling. Scientists examined the chemical composition and elemental abundances found in two sources. Inside planetary nebulae, the gas and dust that's cast off the outer layers of a dying low-mass star known as a white dwarf, and from bloated, ageing, higher-mass stars known as red giants. The analysis reveals that Andromeda's formation was far more dramatic and forceful than that of our own Milky Way galaxy. It seems after an initial intense burst of star formation that created the galaxy, a secondary layer of stars was produced sometime between two and four and a half billion years ago, most likely triggered by what scientists call a wet merger. That is, a merger of two gas-rich galaxies that instigates a large amount of star formation, a process called starburst. Scientists have long thought that Andromeda experienced a major merger of two galaxies based on the position and motion of individual stars within the galaxy. The study's lead author, Chucky Kobayashi, from the University of Hertfordshire, says the research shines new light on the nature and impact of such mergers using the chemical composition of stars, and it explains how stars and elements were formed throughout the history of Andromeda. She says it's a fantastic example of how galactic archaeology can provide fresh new insights into the history of the universe. By analysing the chemical abundances of different ages of stars in Andromeda, the authors could bring to life its history and better understand its origins. Although in many ways Andromeda is really very similar to our own Milky Way galaxy, they're similar in size, they're both spiral disk galaxies, the new research confirms that its history is far more intense and dramatic, with bursts of actively forming stars in abundance and two distinct eras of star formation. Kobayashi's theoretical model predicts two distinct chemical compositions of stars in the two disk components of Andromeda. One has ten times more oxygen than iron, while the other has similar amounts of oxygen and iron. The modelling was confirmed through spectroscopic observations of planetary nebula and also by studying red giants using the Webb Space Telescope. Kobayashi says oxygen is one of the so-called alpha elements produced in massive stars. The others are neon, magnesium, silicon, sulphur, argon and calcium. She says oxygen and argon have been measured with planetary nebulae, but Andromeda is so far away that the James Webb Space Telescope was required to measure other elements, including iron. Andromeda is the biggest galaxy in the local galactic group, which includes the Milky Way. It's located about 2.5 million light years away. The Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are moving closer together. In fact, they're expected to collide in about 3.7 to 4.5 billion years from now. Eventually they'll merge, forming a giant new elliptical galaxy. Andromeda contains over a trillion stars, that's twice as many as the Milky Way, and it's about 220,000 light years across. Now based on current estimates, Andromeda appears to have more older stars than the Milky Way, and it also has far less new star production going on than the Milky Way. The rate of supernovae that is exploding stars in the Milky Way is also about double that of Andromeda. Andromeda is surrounded by a large, massive halo of hot gas. In fact, it's estimated to contain more than half the mass of all the stars in the galaxy. This nearly invisible halo stretches about a million light years from its host galaxy, almost halfway to the Milky Way. Using a good pair of binoculars or backyard telescope, you should be able to see the dark dust lanes in Andromeda's spiral arms, and you'll even notice its bright central galactic core. This is Space Time. Still to come, quartz crystals discovered in the clouds of a hot gas giant and a new study underway to try and understand the sun's heating. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
Astronomers using NASA's James Webb Space Telescope have detected evidence of quartz nanocrystals in high-altitude clouds on the exoplanet WASP-17b. The planet is a hot Jupiter located some 1,300 light-years from Earth. The detection, which was uniquely possible thanks to Webb's mid-infrared instrument, marks the first time that silica particles have been spotted in an exoplanet's atmosphere. The study's lead author, David Grant from the University of Bristol, says he was thrilled with the discovery. Grant says he knew from earlier Hubble observations that there must be aerosols, tiny particles making up clouds or haze, within WASP-17b's atmosphere. But he didn't expect them to be made of quartz. Silicates, minerals rich in silicon and oxygen, make up the bulk of planet Earth and its moon, as well as many other rocky objects in our solar system and they're thought to be extremely common right across the galaxy. But the silicate grains previously detected in the atmospheres of exoplanets and brown dwarfs all appear to have been made from magnesium-rich silicates like olivine and pyroxene, not quartz alone, which is pure silicon oxide. The results put a new spin on science's understanding of how exoplanet clouds form and evolve. The authors fully expected to see magnesium silicates but what they're seeing instead are likely to be the building blocks of those, the tiny seed particles needed to form the larger silicate grains that are detected in cooler exoplanets and brown dwarfs. With a volume more than seven times that of Jupiter and a mass less than one-half that of Jupiter, WASP-17b is one of the largest yet least dense known exoplanets. This, along with its short orbital period, just 3.7 Earth days, makes the planet ideal for transmission spectroscopy, a technique that involves measuring the filtering and scattering effects of the planet's atmosphere on starlight. Webb observed the WASP-17 system for nearly 10 hours, collecting more than 1,275 brightness measurements in the 5 to 12 micron mid-infrared range as the planet crossed the star. Then, by subtracting the brightness of the individual wavelengths of light that reached the telescope when the planet was in front of the star from those of the star when it was on its own, the team were able to calculate the amount of each wavelength blocked by the planet's atmosphere. And what emerged was an unexpected bump at 8.6 microns, a feature that would not be expected if the clouds were made of magnesium silicates or other possible high-temperature aerosols like aluminum oxide, but which makes perfect sense if they're made of quartz. While these crystals are probably similar in shape to the pointy hexagonal prisms found in geodes, each one is only about 10 nanometers across. That's one millionth of a centimetre. The Hubble data actually played a key role in constraining the size of the particles. The authors knew there was silica from the web's data but they needed the visible and near-infrared observations from Hubble for context in order to figure out how large the crystals were. Unlike mineral particles found in clouds on Earth, the quartz crystals detected in the clouds of WASP-17b are not swept up from the rocky surface. Instead, they originate in the atmosphere itself. You see, WASP-17b is extremely hot, around 1,500 degrees Celsius, and the pressure where they form up high in the atmosphere is only about one thousandth that of what we experience on Earth's surface. In these conditions, solid crystals can form directly from gas without needing to go through a liquid phase first. Understanding what the clouds are made of is crucial for understanding the planet as a whole. Hot Jupiters like WASP-17b are made primarily of hydrogen and helium, with small amounts of other gases like water vapour and carbon dioxide. If we only consider the oxygen that's in these gases and neglect to include all the oxygen locked up in the minerals like quartz, then we'll significantly underestimate the total abundance. These silicate crystals are telling scientists a lot about the inventory of different minerals and how they all come together to shape the environment of the planet. Exactly how much quartz is there and how pervasive it is in the clouds is hard to determine. The clouds are likely present along the day-night transition zone, the terminator, which was the region where these observations probed. Given that the planet is tidally locked with one side constantly facing its host star and the other cooler side in perpetual darkness, it's likely that the clouds circulate around the planet but vaporise when they reach the hotter day side. Considering the amount of convection going on, the winds could be moving these tiny glassy particles at thousands of kilometres per hour. This is Space Time. Still to come, understanding the sun's heating processes, and later in the science report, 
discovery of a link between women eating ultra-processed foods and an increased risk of depression. All that and more still to come on Space Time. One of the greatest and longest running mysteries of our sun is why the outer atmosphere is far hotter than its surface. The sun has a surface temperature of about 6,000 degrees Celsius. But as you move further into the atmosphere, it gets hotter, eventually reaching millions of degrees Celsius. And that doesn't make sense. The further away you get from a heat source, the cooler it's supposed to get, not hotter. Researchers now believe they may have an answer, and they hope to prove it with the help of NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Parker's the first spacecraft to enter the zone surrounding the Sun, where heating looks fundamentally different from what had previously been seen in space. This allows scientists to test different theories on what's causing this heating. And one of these hypotheses is that the heating is due to small magnetic waves travelling back and forth within the zone. Solving the riddle would help scientists better understand and predict solar weather events. These geomagnetic storms, or space weather, can cause serious threats to Earth's power grid, to its communications and navigation systems, and to orbiting spacecraft and their crews. Parker Principal Investigator Justin Casper says whatever the physics behind the superheating, it's a puzzle that's been staring scientists in the eye for at least 500 years. The theory and how the team are using Parker to test it has now been described in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. In this zone of preferential heating above the sun's surface, temperatures rise overall. More bizarre still, individual elements are heated to different temperatures preferentially. Some heavier ions are superheated until they're ten times hotter than the hydrogen that's everywhere in the area. And that would make them hotter than the core of the sun, which is around 15 million degrees Celsius. Such high temperatures cause the solar atmosphere to swell to many times the diameter of the sun, and they're the reason we see an extended corona during solar eclipses. Casper says in that sense, the coronal heating mystery has been visible to astronomers for more than half a millennium, even if the high temperatures were only appreciated within the last century. The same zone also features hydromagnetic alphan waves, which move back and forth between the outermost edge and the sun's surface. At the outermost edge, called the alphan point, the solar wind moves faster than the alphan speed, and the waves can no longer travel back to the sun. Casper says that when you're below this alphan point, you're in this soup of waves, where charged particles are deflected and accelerated by waves coming from all directions. In trying to estimate how far from the sun's surface this preferential heating stops, the authors examined decades of observations of the solar wind by NASA's wind spacecraft. They looked at how much of the helium's increased temperature close to the sun was washed out by collisions between ions and the solar wind as they travelled out towards the Earth. Watching the helium temperature decay allowed scientists to measure the distance to the outer edge of the zone. Casper says he takes all this data and treats it like a sort of stopwatch to figure out how much time's elapsed since the wind was first superheated. Since they know how fast the wind's moving, they can convert that information to distance. And those calculations put the outer edge of the superheating zone roughly 10 to 50 solar radii out from the surface. It was impossible to be any more precise since some values could only be guessed at. Initially, Casper didn't think to compare his estimate of the zone's location with the Alphen point, but he wanted to know if there was a physically meaningful location in space that produced the outer boundary. After reading that the Alphen point and other surfaces had been observed to expand and contract with solar activity, Casper, together with co-author Christopher Klein from the University of Arizona, reworked their analysis, looking at year-to-year changes rather than considering the entire wind mission. And they were shocked to find that the outer boundary of the zone of preferential heating and the Alphen point moved in lockstep with each other in a totally predictable fashion, despite being completely independent calculations. So, does the Alphen point mark the outer edge of the heating zone? And what exactly is changing under the Alphen point that superheats heavy ions? The authors will know the answer to that as Parker gets ever closer to the sun. Parker Solar Probe was launched back in August 2018, and it made its first rendezvous with the Sun in November of that year. 
Ever since then, it's been doing a series of gravity assist loops around Venus in order to more precisely target a closer and closer swoop of the Sun's surface. As Parker gets ever closer with each pass, the probe will eventually fall below the Alphen point. Casper says that thanks to the Parker Solar Probe, he'll ultimately be able to definitively determine through local measurements what processes lead to the acceleration of the solar wind and the preferential heating of certain elements. Parker Solar Probe launched in 2018 and over the next seven years slowly move closer and closer to the sun. The visible surface of the sun is at a temperature of about 6,000 degrees. Just hundreds of miles above that surface, something very mysterious happens. By the time we're in the extended solar atmosphere corona, we see temperatures of millions of degrees. And you wind up with this swamp of electromagnetic fields, ions and electrons whizzing around. We think there's a zone around the sun where this preferential heating happens. Casper decided to compare the Alphane point along with the estimated zone of preferential heating. The result was two independent calculations moving together as one. At some point, the Alphane speed drops below the speed of the solar wind. The wind is escaping from the sun. Any waves that would be given off by the solar wind would never make it back to the solar surface. We call this the Alphane point. That's Parker Principal Investigator Justin Casper. And this is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Researchers believe they've found a link between women eating ultra-processed foods and an increased risk of depression. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that the link was especially strong for foods containing artificial sweeteners. Scientists looked into the eating habits and mental health of some 31,000 women between the ages of 42 and 62. They say although the mechanisms that associate ultra-processed foods to depression are unknown, their findings suggest that artificial sweeteners and artificially sweetened beverages could be, as previous researchers suggested, eliciting certain changes in the brain that are associated with the development of depression. Scientists have discovered that the majority of critical habitats and movement pathways for southern greater gliders in Queensland lie outside the protected areas. Researchers used innovative technology to map mature forests to identify potential habitat and corridors that were essential for the survival of the endangered species. Their findings, reported in the journal Pacific Conservation Biology, show that most of the important remaining glider habitat in Queensland occurred within privately owned areas. And these areas are vulnerable to things like logging, clearing and other threats. A new study has found that chat GPT might be better than doctors when it comes to following recommended guidelines for managing depression. A report of the journal Family Medicine and Community Health claims the team offered eight patient summaries which included gender, social class and depression severity to both chat GPT and 1,249 French doctors. The authors found that compared to the human doctors, ChatGPT was more likely to offer recommendations which were in line with clinical guidelines. In addition, ChatGPT didn't exhibit any gender or social biases in its recommended treatment. While the authors acknowledge ethical and security consideration risks that come with using ChatGPT, they say the results still showed the artificial intelligence had the potential to enhance decision-making in healthcare. But the authors admit the study doesn't take into account ongoing visits and care, and they admit there's often no substitute for human clinical judgment. Turning your old analog camera digital, new hardware and updates from Apple, and big techs after more of your money. With the details on those and other stories, we're joined by technology editor Alex Sahara of Reut from techadvice.life. New and unverified accounts will need to pay one US dollar a year, so not a month, but a year, to be able to post and interact with other posts. And 
This is uh, being rolled out to start with in New Zealand and the Philippines. And they say that they're doing this to bolster their efforts to reduce spam, to reduce the manipulation of their platform, and also to, to you know, clamp down on bot activity uh, while balancing platform accessibility. They already are charging US $8 a month to be able to verify uh, have the blue tick, yeah, verify your account. And they'd like to have a, a fee, I've read, that of $3.99, you'll have more ads, but it's a cheaper fee. And they will also want to have a more expensive fee that will have no ads at all. They want to get rid of all this... Uh, the bots on the platform. So this is the beginning of uh, social media networks charging you. Uh, I know that Facebook has always had a tagline that says Facebook will be free and always will be. But even Facebook wants to start charging you for verifying your accounts. And I think the days of the free ride on the internet are coming to an end. Is it just a case of getting greedy? After all, we already are the uh, the commodity being sold. Sure. Well, look, existing users aren't going to be charged. You're sort of grandfathered in. I guess this is also a way of getting people to sign up as quick as they can. I mean, they could always start charging everybody in the future. Look, it costs a lot of money to uh, run these services and unless you have enough ads coming in. They're making billions. They're making billions. Come on. Well, certainly people like Google and Facebook are. X has been under attack by the ADL and by a lot of organizations who claim that because X has removed its moderation and and allowing people to speak freely, a lot of companies will just have to pull advertising back. So Elon has to pay back a $44 billion loan and uh, that's not cheap. Uh, And so you know he's got to get some money somehow. Some new technology and new updates for iPhone users. Tell us about it all. Yeah, well, let's start with the USB-C pencil for iPad. So you've got the original pencil that had the lightning port plugged into the bottom, and then you had the Apple Pencil 2 that connected to the top of your iPad magnetically, and it charged wirelessly, and there was no way of plugging a cable into it. So Apple now has a third pencil that still connects magnetically to the top of iPads, the ones with the flat edges, but it charges in pairs using USB-C. Now, it is cheaper than the original Apple Pencil, the very first one, but it leaves some out. It leaves out the ability to do pressure sensitivity. Most of the styluses have 4,096 points of pressure sensitivity. So when you push harder on the screen, you get a thicker, darker line, which is something important for artists. But it's not so important if you're just using your pencil to annotate, to handwrite, to draw simple imagery and do the basic things that people use the stylus for. If you're a professional artist or you really want to get more details in your artwork, then you would get the Apple Pencil 2, which has the 4,096 pressure points. And you can also double tap on the tip of the pencil to change between brushes. So Apple has launched a cheaper pencil and coming on October the 24th will be iOS 17.1. Now, amongst other advances, which include things like being able to send airdrops over the internet so that you can start the airdrop between two devices and then walk away. You'll need to have plenty of data. But there's a problem that people have been reporting with their iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max where they have this burning problem. So you have these ghost-like images of the keyboard and the icons on the home screen that even after you go into a different app, you can still see these ghostly images. And so the 17.1 update is supposed to fix that problem. So the ghostly images and the burning stops happening. And if you're still having that problem, then you should go back to Apple and swap it for a new iPhone. And I hear there's a new digital film that fits in the back of all those analog cameras I've got lying around the place. Yeah, this is a Kickstarter project called I'm Back film. And uh, I've got a link to it on my website and a video. Now, this will bridge the analog nostalgia and digital innovation gap. I mean, all those cameras that are sitting around that film's expensive, digital processing, film's expensive, processing photos is expensive. I mean, you can't get it down to the chemist anymore like you used to be able to and get your film processed inexpensively. So this looks like a yellow roll of Kodak film and uh, sticking outside of the film is a digital sensor that can snap the image when you push the shutter and the image is being captured on these electronics. And it saves it all to an SD card. The company has already made several prototypes over the past few years. This is the most advanced one yet. And they're trying to bring analog cameras back and be that bridge between the old-fashioned and the new. So it's already been fully funded. The company now has to mass produce them over the next few months. But it's always fascinating to see when modern technology revives retro technologies. We have more vinyl records sold than CDs these days. Vinyl has come back. People using old-fashioned turntables has come back. And now people using old analog cameras with a digital interface is going to be the new normal. And what is this on the website? Okay, so at techadvice.life, you can see a new system to easily organize your Apple Watch bands. There's videos from uh, Yuffie and Dreamy. There's a robotic dog there that I took an extended video of. There's launch events that I went to that I film videos of. And uh, there's always more content arriving almost every day. So please come and have a look. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from techadvice.life.
And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 